hello, and welcome to Ipsy Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host today, Guy Hamilton Smith, legal fellow with the Sex Offense Litigation Policy Resource Center at the Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. My guest today is Professor Benjamin Levin at Colorado Law at the University of Colorado. And we will be discussing his article, Mens Rea Reform and Its Discontents, that will appear in the Journal of Criminal Law and Criminology. Uh, ben, welcome to Ipsy Dixit. Thanks so much, Guy, and thank you for having me. Um, so, you know, as we've sort of talked about before, you know, I really have enjoyed this article and the ideas um, that you talk about uh, talk about in it. But to start off, you know, for any of our listeners who might not be, um, you know, as, as into criminal law or criminal justice as uh, as we are, can you sort of unpack a bit the idea of of what mens rea what mens rea is? Um, what mens rea reform is, and also how did you become kind of sort of interested in this topic? Sure thing. So, um, so I say this, and my um, my my first year criminal law students are currently studying for their uh, for their criminal law exam. So, um, so call this discussion of mens rea a little bit of a, a review for them. So, mens rea <laughs> um, is the idea that that in order to be guilty of a crime. A defendant needs to have some kind of bad mental state. They need to have a bad mind. Um, so uh, if you have a, a criminal statute that says it's a crime to, for example, possess a gun, um, often the statute won't specify what mental state you need to have. What happens if there's you know, a gun in your backpack and you actually didn't know that the gun was in your backpack? Um, or what happens if you went out and bought a gun and you put it in your pocket meaning to have that gun there? Uh, you know, think about this in the context of homicide. Uh, if someone if someone is speeding on the highway and they hit another person, and unfortunately that leads to a death, did they intend to cause that death? Did they cause that death recklessly or negligently? So these mental states are kind of a staple of uh, substantive criminal law discussion, a staple of sort of the law school first year substantive criminal law curriculum. And it speaks a language of moral philosophy, determining whether conduct is right or wrong. And in some respect, it's it's a, a kind of, call it sort of a formalistic or or, um, or old fashioned or, or very heavily moral discussion of criminal law. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, criminal statutes again have these requirements in order for a prosecutor to prove that a defendant is guilty. She must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that whatever the mental state requirement is. Um, so that's mens rea. And um, mens rea reform legislation has been around for some time, as have discussions of mens rea reform. So the, the core issue or core concern is that, um, and shocking though it might be to, to admit this, legislators actually don't always draft great statutes. I know that's unbelievable, <laughs> but yeah, it's true. Yeah, none of our, so, our listeners <laughs> that. Who have thunk it? Um, so uh, you have situations where a legislature won't specify the mens rea. They won't actually specify the element of the crime. So for as long as courts have been interpreting statutes and trying to come up with, with determinations of guilt um, or, or looking at the, the legal questions related to it, the courts have had to figure out what to do with those silent statutes, with situations where a law doesn't actually say intention or recklessness or negligence. Um, and so there's tons of case law on this. There's tons of scholarship written about how courts should do that. When should a court determine that legislators actually, for example, meant strict liability when they left it silent, where they actually didn't intend for a prosecution to, a prosecutor to have to prove uh, bad intent or some sort of mens rea, um, and where should Congress, or pardon me, should courts read that in? Again, this comes up in a range of context. It comes up in, in context relating to um, uh, other constitutional rights, to kind of the way that criminal law might infringe on the First Amendment um, and elsewhere. But long story short, in the scholarship on mens rea, uh, there's long been some sense that we need some kind of way of standardizing this interpretive test. Um, the model penal code, um, which is uh, not the law anywhere, but is this thing that um, that is, again, a staple of uh, first year law school classes. It's something that's tested heavily on um, our exams. Generally speaking, it's, it's this model that, um, that the American Law Institute, sort of a collection of, of, of fancy law professors and lawyers and judges, um, came up with uh, 
in the early 1960s that sets, sets forth sort of models for legislators. Um, so the model penal code steps into this debate, uh, establishes a, sort of a default mental state requirement. So if the statute, if a statute is silent, a court is supposed to read in recklessness, which means the prosecutor would need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a defendant is reckless. Anyway, a lot of background. Long story short, we get to the mens rea reform legislation. This is the thing that's really uh, taken off um, in the last, let's call it like decade or so, and it's particularly at the federal level, um, uh, folks pushing to have legislation passed that would apply this default mental state requirement in the federal system. Um, and so uh, a lot of that has to do with the incredible rise in number of federal criminal laws. We don't know exactly how many there are. Um, last count I saw somewhere in the neighborhood of 5,000. So there are a huge number of federal criminal laws on the books. The concern is that many people might unknowingly commit federal crimes. Uh, and the folks pushing mens rea reform legislation think that's a problem and think that um, that courts should be reading in mental state requirements to those statutes to try to uh, prevent some sort of unknowing offending. Right. Because I know in your in your in your uh, article, like you cite, for example, you, you cite the uh, crime a day Twitter feed. Um, for sort of examples of the broad sort of federal criminalization. And so mens rea reform would try to step in and, and try to limit the scope of that, right? Is that, exactly, is that exactly, of, right? yeah. Um, and there's a, there's a massive literature on this phenomenon of over-criminalization, this idea kind of that, that, that so much is criminalized in society. Yeah, the, you know, the crime of day Twitter feed is a great, um, is a great instance of this. But, um, but situations, and there are lots in this literature, there are tons of these examples of these one-off cases um, that, um, that are supposed to, and I think often do, seem really, really absurd, right? Some type of conduct that maybe we can imagine being regulated in some way, it turns out is actually the basis for a federal felony. Any conviction, um, you know, the mm-hmm. I'm dry, you know, driving your snowmobile in the wrong place. I don't have a snowmobile, but but assuming I did, I guess it's it's not impossible that I might accidentally take it to the wrong place. Um, you know, a falling afoul of certain of certain packaging laws, uh, things along those lines. And, and you know, I will note, and this gets into the whole thing. Um, the literature on overcriminalization, the sort of fear that society was doing too much criminalizing conduct. Um, really takes off sometime in the 1960s, uh, is generally associated with more of a civil libertarian left. There's a lot of concern that that what the federal government is doing and state legislatures are doing uh, is using criminal law to go after conduct um, that, whether it's victimless, whether it's harmless, whether it's rooted in some kind of objectionable morals, uh, but that it's a problem. So examples given there, often the kind of the so-called anti-sodomy laws, a lot of writing about criminalizing abortion, about criminalizing so-called vice crimes. Um, and, and there's kind of generally speaking, we're talking about somewhere on the political left that this is coming from. There's sort of a shift over time and, you know, clearly, um, that, that concern remains um, on the political left, but a lot of the activism for mens rea reform, a lot of the activism around overcriminalization, um, something like in the 1980s starts to take on more of a um, right libertarian bent. So the focus is less on some of those those crimes that we might associate with being particularly objectionable to, to someone with. Um, liberal or progressive or, or other left politics, um, rather there's more of a focus on regulatory offenses um, and that uh, it takes on more of a, a kind of traditional right libertarian bent where the, the concern is actually sort of government run amok um, and that, that markets are being regulated too too closely and the, you know, maybe the, the nastiest or most objectionable iteration of that uh, are these criminal statutes. Mm-hmm. So, um, you, you know, one thing that I wanted to, um, you know, sort of uh, ask about was that, I mean, so a lot of criminal justice reform activity has, you know, sort of originated from more kind of liberal circles. But, um, you know, so, but you wrote, uh, you recently wrote an article that I think appeared in Slate um, with Carissa Hessick at UNC about Elizabeth Warren's proposal to um, I, I guess, sort of impose a, a more of a negligence standard for corporate criminal liability. Yeah. And um, yeah, someone <laughs> someone tweeted that uh, you all should be, that the authors of this piece should be locked up, which I, I think is probably a pretty good segue into <laughs> some of the other issues that your paper, that your paper uh, addresses. But um, I guess before we get there, you know, there's, you talk about liberal opposition to mens rea reform, 
So can you kind of unpack um, that a little bit and why, you know, why liberals might be upset with the idea of mens rea reform? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, generally speaking, I think in a lot of a lot of public discourse, um, there's an assumption or, or a general framing that, you know, tough, a lot of tough on crime policies or politics have their roots in the political right, uh, enjoy widespread support in at least certain conservative circles. Um, and that, you know, generally speaking, left of center and again, huge huge um, divergences there. Um, we might see people who are going to be more receptive to critiques of the criminal system. And I think that's true to a certain extent. We can talk more about that kind of as we move on, obviously, the politics of, of I'd say, the criminal justice reform movement. But of course, there's not just one movement. The criminal justice reform movements um, are very complicated. And, you know, for my money, um, the most exciting work that's being done um, is being done um, in corners of the, of the political left. But, um, you know, I think what's important to note in the mens rea reform context is that most of the opposition to these bills has come from um, has come from sort of a, a progressive to center left position. So, um, so right. So, Carissa and I wrote this piece about um, about legislation proposed by Elizabeth Warren, um, and and not to pick on Warren here, but in the in the article, um, I, I often use Warren as as an Alexander Warren as an example of someone. Who's been um, who's been very strongly opposed to mens rea reform legislation, and the primary claim is that uh, this legislation is really going to shield um, white collar offenders. It's going to shield people accused of environmental crime, of financial crime, um, and that those are exactly the people who should be prosecuted and who should be incarcerated. Um, so, just to kind of step us back. Uh, the reason that um, there's this specific concern about about mens rea reform um, is, is, first of all, of course, the political support that it already has. Right, a lot of that um, is from uh, conservative or libertarian organizations who are speaking the language of overregulation. So, you know, obviously, if you're someone who cares about regulation, maybe you're a little a little skeptical. Um, you're a little skeptical at first. Also, there's a you know I highlighted before this idea of the default mental state provision. But there's another component of mens rea reform legislation, or at least some of these recent bills, um, and that's a requirement that um, the prosecution prove that uh, a defendant, if she were doing something. Um, so I'm trying to think of the best way of phrasing this. That's a convoluted thing. The idea is. Um, a, uh, well, a, pro- a prosecutor would need to would need to prove that um, that uh, that a defendant knew what she was doing was unlawful if a reasonable person would not otherwise think that her conduct was unlawful. So step back. Let me just give you two examples. Right. Imagine situation one. We have a defendant um, and she burns down her neighbor's house and then she's prosecuted um, and she tries to, to tell the prosecutor or her defense attorney argues, well, like she didn't know that burning down her neighbor's house was a crime. Um, you know, probably no dice here from a defense standpoint, um, because, uh, again, the reasonable person is a bizarre concept um, for, for non-lawyers out there. For lawyers, it is as well. Tons of writing on this. Um, but a reasonable person probably would understand that burning down her neighbor's house was was criminal, so a prosecutor wouldn't need to prove that. But under some of these mens rea reform statutes, imagine a different situation where, um, let's say, uh, let's say I'm a corporate executive and I fail to um, to file the right um, reporting forms, um, and I'm prosecuted because it turns out that that's a that's a criminal offense, and I say, um, gee, I, I didn't know that was a crime. Now, in that context. Under these reform bills, I might have a defense of um, uh, because a reasonable person would not have known that this was otherwise criminal conduct. So if you're if you're someone like Senator Warren, who's really concerned about um, about the criminal law being able to go after some of these uh, some of these institutional actors, anything that's going to give them an out is going to be objectionable. So as a result, um, there's writing from Senator Warren, uh, President Obama, and some of his work on criminal justice reform, a range of other folks have expressed this idea that mens rea reform is just going to make life harder for prosecutors, and that's a bad thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, like, I mean, so to, I guess to recap, so there's sort of two sort of central components of, you know, proposed mens rea reform. One is the default mental state requirement, but then also providing people with a defense for if they, you know, 
while the sort of traditional legal, you know, legal saying has been, well, ignorance of the law is, is you know, is no defense. Um, well, in some cases, it might be, um, is, is kind of the way that um, some of these proposals are being, um, are being offered. Is that, is yeah. that an accurate? Yeah, that's, that's it? exactly right. And that, you know, the, the second, that second component, the sort of um, something that looks more like what we um, usually refer to as a mistake of law defense, um, is the piece of it that's potentially more radical. Although, again, to note, right, this, um, the recent bill introduced by Senator Warren, um, the uh, Corporate Executive Accountability Act, which parallels an earlier bill that she had introduced, the Ending Too Big to Jail Act, um, which are the laws that um, that Carissa and I wrote about in that slate piece that you mentioned. Um, you know, those those bills actually take aim specifically at mental state requirements and, and try to try to drop them. Right. So um, in situations mm-hmm. where, for example, usually um, an executive might uh, might be able to be prosecuted if a prosecutor could show that that she had acted recklessly or ne- or, 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 will, or willfully or intentionally um, that. In that context, Senator Warren wants to drop the standard to negligently. So the idea being, rather than that um, an executive was aware of a risk and chose to disregard it, um, which would usually be uh, be a recklessness standard, um, instead Senator Warren want, would want to drop it to a negligent standard, which would be a situation where an executive wasn't aware of a risk, but a reasonable person should have been aware of that risk, um, right? And so, so the move again is to try to make it easier. For prosecutors to go after defendants in these situations, and again, a lot of writing about the fact that um, that uh, that um, at least certain forms of white collar crime are not prosecuted uh, as vigorously as uh, some folks would like, um, particularly when we're dealing with very affluent or very powerful defendants. Um, a lot of explanations for that, and some have to do with the fact that it's difficult for prosecutors to. Um, to, um, to successfully make out claims. Some of it has to do just with um, maybe resistance on their part to trying because they know that unlike in many other corners or most other corners of the, the criminal system, um, that uh, you're looking at defendants who are actually quite well resourced and going to be able to put on a pretty effective defense, um, unlike most of the system where um, where the, the vast majority of people are um, are indigent and are dealing with um, with some type of appointment counsel and, and uh, just don't have the time or resources to to fight the government even now. And so, you know, one thing, I mean, I mentioned earlier about the person who, you know, commented on the slate piece saying that, you know, whoever wrote this needs to be locked up. Um, and and I, I, always, I thought that was really uh, in some ways perfect given, you know, what else you discussed in your paper. Um, and, and I'm wondering, so, you, you, I mean, you talk. There are several different sort of broader problems that um, this sort of lens of mens rea reform um, illustrates when it comes to criminal justice. And you know, the, the first of the problems that you sort of discuss in the paper is this can sort of. Well, I mean, I guess if you can sort of unpack this idea of um, you know, sort of governing through crime or seeing our government as. Um, its primary sort of reason for existence as criminalizing and punishing people. Yeah, sure, right. So, so here I'm drawing very heavily from the work um, from the work of Jonathan Simon, um, who's this fantastic book called "Governing Through Crime." Um, Simon's a professor at uh, at Berkeley, where he kind of does does law, but also criminology, sociology, and um, it's a it's a fascinating book. And and um, and Simon's claim uh, is essentially that the the model of governance, and he looks particularly sort of at a um, post 9/11 world. Um, the model of governance that we see is a is a governance rooted in fear. Where, um, where social problems are framed in terms of fear and the response to those concerns. And you know, Simon looks at um, regulation of schools. He looks at a range of regulations of the workplace. Um, the response comes in the form of, of criminal legislation. So when society identifies a problem, when voters or legislators do, um, they legislate in some way. And there are lots of different ways to legislate, but the dominant model has become using criminal law. Now, I think there are a bunch of different explanations for this. Um, one is maybe it just feeds our punitive impulse. Um, this is something that, um, that Miriam Baer, one of the I think, really most knowledgeable folks about, about white collar crime out there, um, writes about in terms of the work of choosing punishment, but that there's maybe some kind of um, way in which it's morally satisfying or it answers people's urge to see uh, to see some version of accountability. Uh, there's also another idea that I tried to explore in the paper, and that's of um, what the great 
of critical race theorist Derek Bell described as interest convergence. Um, and I think this is something that's uh, that's quite troubling and we do see play out in a number of corners of criminal lawmaking, which is that we have different groups with very different ideologies or very different concerns, um, effectively compromising in different moments uh, to reach what winds up being at least ostensibly a mutually desirable end. Of course, what I just described is like a politics works, I guess. <laughs> like, there's a lot of compromising, and if you're going to compromise with someone, you need to come from someplace. But in the criminal aspect, particularly if we're thinking um, from a left-right standpoint, there are a number of these areas um, that I focus on. Some of this I've written about in the past, particularly in the context of gun regulation um, and criminal gun regulation where you'll have um, folks on the political left, again, really broadly conceived, um, who have some sort of concern that they think that government can and should address. So call that the problem of gun violence, call that here the problem um, of corporate actors out of control or unrestrained capitalism. Uh, you know, we can we can look to a range of areas, but so from somewhere on the left, there's this, um, there's this concern about the social problem, but because of a range of other political forces, maybe it's going to be really hard to get um, civil gun regulation passed. Maybe it's going to be much harder to just pass um, civil or non-criminal uh, regulations that are going to affect the financial industry. Um, so what happens? Instead, we have this kind of interest convergence or compromise story because on the political right and maybe in other corners of sort of the central left or on the political left, you have folks who care less about those issues, but who have some appetite for punishment who have some tough on crime ideology or believe that um, believe that we should strengthen the carceral or prosecutorial state. So in these moments, we have the interest convergence. We have sort of tough on crime marrying um, the interests of some form of regulatory left. What happens when well, we wind up with these criminal statutes that are, and I won't say supported by everyone, because of course that's not true, but enjoy really broad bipartisan support. So, you know, to take uh, the example of the gun context, something I've written about elsewhere, um, in the mid 1990s, um, this uh, this project comes uh, comes to be Project Exile in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, the idea of Project Exile was that in response to fears of gun or actually real concerns about gun crime in um, in Richmond, Virginia. The cases that could be prosecuted in state court would instead be prosecuted in federal court where potential prison sentences were much longer. And also because of the uh, peculiarities, but that doesn't begin to do justice to it, um, the horrors of the federal system, uh, people who are incarcerated in the federal system could be incarcerated anywhere in the country. So a literal exile um, from the state of Virginia. So it'd be more difficult for people convicted to see friends or family members. Um, anyway, long story short, project uh, wind up getting bipartisan support. And then in the 96 presidential election, there's this kind of unbelievable um, race or battle between the Democrats and the Republicans to claim Project Exile. So everyone wants to claim, everyone wants to claim that they're tougher on crime. Now, again, right, this is you know, thinking back to that mid 90s moment that, um, that Right. To keep coming up in our conversations of criminal justice policy. Uh, but I think that this interesting iteration or interesting illustration where um, some some of the folks on the right and some of the supporters of Project Exile um, might have been coming from a very different place or imagined a very different world of gun regulation than, for example, um, folks in the Brady campaign, um, but ultimately they were winding up in the same place. And a lot of that has to do, as I say, I think with the realities of politics, where it's just way more attractive or way easier to get some of these criminal statutes passed. Um, and some of that's politics. And I do think some of that, though, is just human impulses about punishment. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, on a sort of related point when it comes to the, I guess, the, the ease with which um, you know, sort of people can agree uh, on, you know, that, that criminal justice is, a, is an appropriate vehicle. The, the other thing, one of the other um, concepts that you discuss in the paper that, you know, the people also seem to have agreement about uh, when it comes to criminal justice is this concept of um, leveling up. And I'm wondering if you can talk about that 
in this yeah, context? Yeah, so, so I think this is a, a concept or idea, an idea that's starting to get um, a little more traction, less academic work on it. Um, although, you know, I would cite to, um, to really great work by my colleague here at Colorado, Aya Gruber, a um, friend of mine, Kate Levine, uh, a professor of criminal law that uh, started at uh, Cardoza, but who's been at St. John's, um, you know, does some great work on this in the context of prosecutions of um of police officers and again a bunch of other folks i think really really thinking about this a lot of great sort of um popular media uh work being done on um, by legal ad- academics um activists other folks but the um the idea after all of those citations um is that right, there's there's tremendous inequality in society and um you know one i guess could contest that although i, I don't really know quite how um, and that inequality manifests itself um, or is reproduced in many different corners. The criminal system as a particularly glaring example, um, treatment of um, of poor people, people of color, people from other marginalized um, or, or less socially powerful groups um, tend to be treated very differently from um from uh, from white affluent defendants, defendants with political connections, um, things along those lines. Um, and the question becomes, once you identify that inequality, how do you respond to it? Um, because I don't think that there's a given answer to that. Um, and I think we can imagine two things. One would be sort of to level down punishment and the other would be to level up punishment. So um, so I think the, the great example of this, uh, Brian Stevenson um, in, uh, in many of his talks and in his work, We'll talk about this situation when he was uh, when he was uh, trying cases in Alabama, um, where he's there and he's there in the courthouse and and um, he's representing um, I think it's like a like fourteen year old black kid and and he's 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 been doing this long enough to know that you know he's going to be dealing with bias he's going to be dealing with racism the stack the deck is stacked against him um, and, and so Stevenson comes up with this motion uh, to have his fourteen year old black client tried like a seven year old white corporate executive, um, right? And so like you know, this is the story and of course you laugh and of course um, the motion does not succeed. Um, but the point being, right, um, one one option would be to say, uh, let's level down punishment. Let's say that, you know, it's bad that there's inequality, but, um, but let's try to treat more people the way the privileged or the powerful um, get treated. Um, let's let's say maybe maybe that should be a model. Maybe the process that, that folks in that position get, maybe the um, the type of counsel, maybe the resources, uh, maybe the respect in court, um, and maybe the actual sentences, uh, maybe those should be models or at least should be the starting point. The leveling up punishment, and this is one of my big concerns in the paper um, and in a lot of my work, uh, is that um, is that instead the response I think too often is to level up punishment, is to say, um, look, there's inequality. Let's treat that 70 year old white corporate executive um, like Brian Stevenson's 14 year old client in Alabama. Um, and and to me, there are a bunch of things to worry about with that. Um, first and foremost, it assumes. The, the way Brian Stevens client or the way um, or the way lots of um, lots of the folks who are actually in the system are treated is okay right that our um, our current system that our for current forms of punishment that our, our structures of incarceration um, the procedural rights enjoyed by uh, enjoyed by the poor the less powerful that those are good things um, and I don't think that's right um, and I would also argue if you look at uh, at really decades of writing on criminal law and administration, um, if you look at uh, tons of activism, if you look at writing from judges and other elite actors, um, not to mention folks who, who again, have lived these realities, um, there's a lot of agreement that, that those structures really are not so good, that we don't want to be expanding them and, um, and reproducing them. So I think that's that's the first concern. The second I think is is what to me is a faulty assumption that you could actually achieve equality by by leveling up punishment that by kind of selecting some random smattering of people accused of crimes um, or convicted of crimes and treating them really poorly that would somehow even out the rest of society you know I think it, it serves some kind of of human impulse and maybe you know kind of some, there's some kind of like Schadenfreude going on there that we um, that, that maybe that seeing um, you know seeing the powerful fall and you know, think of bonfire of the vanities or something has some um, has some intuitive appeal. But I'm just really skeptical that 
true equality could be achieved that way, in part because it doesn't actually address the the underlying institutions. Instead, it just singles out some bad actors, um, subjects them to really poor treatment, um, and then everyone's supposed to walk away feeling like these major social problems have been solved. And, and do you think that you mentioned you mentioned Schadenfreude? Um, I mean, do you think that that's sort of you know that or or other sort of motivations like? What do you think underlies this um, impulse? Because as you mentioned, there's two ways that we can go, right? We can level up or we can level down. Um, why Why do you think it is that this is the path we choose and not some other yeah, path? So, I mean, you know, maybe maybe it's something to shun I think it's also, though, it's really difficult. And this is, you know, one of the, the other aspects or one of the other kind of phenomenon that I try to tease out in the paper. It's this, this idea that I call kind of carceral exceptionalism, the idea that... Um, that maybe for for everyone, um, there's a temptation to make exceptions to identify, you know, the the, the really bad defendant or the area of law um, where we think, well, like you know, criminalization shouldn't have a place or should be reduced, but except for this one place that I care really deeply about. And I think that's a lot of it. I think you know, and it's a it's something that concerns me in a lot of. Um, in a lot of, for example, Senator Warren's writing about criminal justice, and again, I find disappointed because I, I find there to be a lot to be excited about um, in terms of in terms of her focuses, um, you know. And I share her concern about um, about uh, income inequality and about um, and about actually doing a better job regulating um, regulating financial markets or other um, or, or corporate actors. But that um, there's what I take to be some kind of an elision or flattening out between accountability and incarceration, right? Um, the, the idea that unless someone is actually put in a cage, they have not been held accountable, um, I think is a, is, a, is a deep social impulse that we see, um, that the way that society sends a message that an issue is cared about, that a victim is cared about, um, or that a defendant or person is... is um, has truly gotten it wrong or is truly deserving of some sort of of um, of punishment or, or just or even kind of social scolding, the way to manifest that is by incarcerating that person. And I think that that's part of the danger here. Once we take that as a given, the leveling down becomes extremely, extremely difficult. Um, and, you know, I think this is it's one of the things that I find really fascinating um, when I teach sentencing and criminal procedure, but in lots of conversations about sentencing, is that once you start setting the baseline high enough for the expectation for what punishment should look like, it becomes really, really hard to tamp it down, right? So you look at, um, you look at Norway, you look at some countries that have, have a maximum prison sentence, so something like 21 years. Um, it means that situations where someone commits a really, really kind of heinous act, something that lots of people view as incredibly harmful, they kill multiple people, whatever the case may be, um, and they're getting 21 years at prison, it totally recalibrates the conversation of, you know, uh, to what extent other wrongdoing needs to be punishment or punished or what that punishment should look like. I think what's so difficult uh, in the U.S. and in our current cultural moment is that there's this reaction to so many forms of punishment that they are a slap on the wrist. And I think that logic and that reaction becomes really dangerous because when you look around and prison sentences or carceral sentences are treated as a slap on the wrist, then it becomes harder and harder to identify and understand what really serious punishment is. And I think that's one way that we wind up with longer and longer sentences. It's one way that we also wind up with this, this idea that you can't actually regulate an industry, you can't deal with a social problem without incarcerating, because anything short of, um, of a prison sentence, or in some cases a jail sentence, isn't going to send the message that you want, isn't going to do the work that you want, right? So in the context of the mens rea reform, sort of looping us back around, um, there are these reports that get put out, you know, Senator Warren's office does the, does some, some other offices do, about um, expressing opposition to mens rea reform. And on the cover of the reports, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cell with the door sliding open. So the idea that people mm-hmm. need to actually be put in those cells in order to bring accountability to those industries, um, and then if that's our baseline assumption, it's got to be so hard to level down because finding someone an enormous amount of money, taking away their business, taking away their ability to work in an area, all kinds of things that have potentially massive social impacts um, 
are viewed as not accountability because someone isn't in a cage at the end. And and so and and so that's sort of why, um, or at least one of the reasons why, like sort of um, you're thinking that incarceration continues to have appeal amongst you know sort of otherwise you know otherwise liberal or um, people who are opposed to mass incarceration in the carceral state. Um, but you mentioned carceral exceptionalism that you know except for certain classes of defendants for. Um, you know, for example, like the effort to restore the vote in Florida, for example, carved out um, people who are convicted of sex offenses or people who are convicted of murder. And so I guess that in this context, that exceptionalism also then extends to, you know, corporate, you know, uh, white collar defendants. Is that, yeah. I mean, is that accurate? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's totally right. And again, I think, you know, a couple, a couple of concerns about this. One, of course, there's an assumption there that we could truly Imagine that like, you and I sat down, we were like, all right, like, you know, we care deeply about criminal justice reform, but they're like, you know, these 12 people and they've committed some kind of crime and we really don't like it. We find it really objectionable. Like, let's just, let's say like, we're going to fix everything, but like those 12 people like get the worst iterations of what we currently have going. I think one of the, the mistakes there, aside from the fact that it's, it's, it's really difficult to identify who those 12 people are. And once we get started with that game, it's really hard. Um, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, but it's right. the idea that we could actually cabin, um, cabin these institutions or cabin these procedures. I think a lot of the, um, a decent amount of writing about, uh, about the, the gang raids in New York, about uh, Rick Barra's role um, in the in SDNY um, in some of these enforcement tactics that um, that swept in uh, lots of particularly um, young uh, Black and uh, Latino men. Um, and, and what's interesting is to see the ways in which um, institutions, criminal laws that were at least ostensibly designed to deal with very specific things. And again, sort of neatly cabined corners of the criminal law. So in that context, we're talking often about laws designed to deal with large scale organized crime um, are used in all kinds of contexts, right? That, that the um, that the legal theories or the or the modes of prosecution or policing migrate, that they can't really be neatly cabined, that once, um, once you once you open up that kind of Pandora's box, it's there and it's potentially there for every criminal defendant. Um, and I will say kind of to our credit um, in some Senator Warren's work, and this is um, in that Corporate Executive Accountability Act, um, there's a lot of language in there that's really specifically trying to identify just certain defendants who could have this, um, who, who would, would have to deal with this uh, this lower mens rea requirement. Um, but still, I think there's a concern about trying to say we can really neatly cabinet to one area. Um, the other bit, uh, piece of this, though, that I think should should worry um, folks who are concerned about criminal justice reform is that a lot of this exceptionalism, either A, I think is rooted in a misunderstanding of who's actually in prison or in jail or, or in the system, or if not a misunderstanding, um, it's... Uh, it, it's suggesting that the logic of ending mass incarceration really could stop with uh, with improving the treatment of some non-controversial areas of criminal law, right? So a lot of folks have written about this. I think you know, kind of of, of John Pfaff's work um, as a great illustration, but you know, a lot of other a lot of other folks dealing with this, saying some version of. Um, and I think uh, you know Rachel Barco's new book on this as well, Marie Gottschalk. Again, a lot of folks, but that. Um, you know, if you uh, if you focus criminal justice reform efforts only on um, you know the the nonviolent uh, non serious drug offense, um, that's just not going to reach that that many people. It's going to reach a lot of people and too many people. But if the if the goal really is dismantling the carceral state or ending mass incarceration, we're going to have to deal with um, with people who've committed crimes that many people in society find right. really concerning, really upsetting. And one worry about this carceral exceptionalism is that um, there's almost a, there's a desire to pretend that we could have our cake and eat it too, that we could really care about criminal justice reform, we could care about ending mass incarceration, but we can continue to hold out this strong form moral opprobrium for some class of um, of defendants or people inside. Um, and there's no real conflict there. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, I, I mean, I have, you know, I feel like I have so many more questions that like I've, 
I'd love to ask, but uh, you know, without running the risk of like making this you know too much longer, I, I have a closing question for you that, and you sort of touched you you sort of touched on this a little while ago, um, but I'd like to I'd like to highlight um, what you touched on and and also sort of ask if you know ask your thoughts on it, <clears throat> but you mentioned you know this word accountability, um, and then of course we we're talking about you know criminal justice and, and punishment, and you mentioned that. <clears throat> excuse me, that, that punishment is sort of the way that we see accountability, that until, you know, a corporate defendant or whoever we, whoever we are, um, whoever has committed the crime, until they're in a cage, like that's the only way that we see um, accountability. And so I'm wondering if, if you have thoughts on whether you think that there is, I guess, more understanding or awareness of the conflation of accountability and punishment. And, um, you know, how, how we might continue to, or, or how scholars might continue to talk about, you know, or probe um, that distinction? Yeah, so right. So it's a, it's a tough question. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a very fraught um, relationship. I mean, I think of so much actually of the, the activist work being done now and being done particularly, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of work. And I think of, um, of insight, um, or survived and punished, or other organizations where um, you're dealing with folks who have been um, who have been uh, been victims of crimes, or, or are really concerned about it, but are not um, are not sort of like the victims' rights movement in what we think of as more of kind of a traditional tough on crime sense of, of folks who care deeply about addressing a social problem, who care deeply about their voices being heard and the voices of other people who who've had similar. Uh, who've had similar uh, situations in life, but that the, the model for that um, is something else, right? So there's a lot of the work on restorative justice, on trying to think about what might models be. But again, take really seriously the need to have accountability, the need to um, to address a fissure in a community or, or, or a social structure, um, but that does not view um, punishment or, or certainly not punishment in the carceral sense um, as the only way of doing that. So, so I think the, the theoretical and the, and the actual kind of on the ground work being done there is really important. But I think maybe a different set of questions or maybe not when we're talking about some of these, these crimes um, that really come up in the, in the mens rea reform world context, right? Some of these crimes involving uh, more powerful defendants committing crimes where the harms are potentially very broad, but that look less like a kind of the traditional, you know, I punch you or, or directly stole from you kind of situation. And, um, and I think lots of different ways of thinking about this. I mean, one is, um, is how much work can monetary or other similar sanctions do on the back end? How much work can be done in response there? Um, you know, to what extent. Um, and again, there's an interesting sort of historical story to be told about um, ways in which certain forms of tort accountability or tort liability uh, become more difficult to get, right? So that, uh, the, the tort reform movement and challenges to the plaintiffs bar there sort of coincide with uh, with more criminal culpability in other areas. Um, but so, you know, some question of, you know, could tort law do more, could back end um, sort of civil regulatory approach more. The other question is whether, um, though, the, the answer, the way we're dealing with some of this is to move away from a reactive model, is to move away from a model where, um, you know, we have a financial crisis and then there are demands for, for certain people to be in, uh, incarcerated and instead towards more of a front end regulatory model. Now, again, this is a challenge and this goes back to the interest convergence piece and why we have punishment. Um, in these areas in the first place. Um, but again, I think a lot of really creative and interesting work being done on thinking about how to make those shifts, how to shift away from a model where um, the only way we deal with income inequality or with problems in the in the market is on the back end in the form of trying to punish as opposed to thinking more about the front end, thinking more about institutional design um, and how regulatory structures could be set up. Again, some of this gets, um, I think, really kind of um, out of out of my world into the world of, of, of folks doing that, um, that financial regulatory or other regulatory uh, scholarship and, and also uh, work in the field. But I think those have to be the questions to say, can we shift away from a world both where where punishment and accountability are the same um, and maybe also shifting away from a world, at least in some cases, where we need to speak in terms of accountability, where we're imagining 
uh, a world of wrongdoing and response rather than trying to think about how we can curtail or um, in some way prevent that wrongdoing on the front end. Great. Um, you know, Ben, again, thank you so much for coming on Ipsy Dixit and talking to us about your scholarship. Thanks so much, Guy. Really, really enjoyed it. We've won passage of a tough new law raising criminal fines 25%. It'll turn up $4 million to train more and better police officers, and it won't cost the taxpayers one single penny. We're fighting for ways to help citizens cut the cost of crime prevention. Ideas like subsidizing alarm systems for merchants and a neighborhood security program, and to protect the lives of police and the public. I've led the fight for gun control to get the small pistol out of the hands of the criminals.